<laughs> so I'm going to talk about transplant. I'm going to talk about why, who, when, and how, and both in autologous and a little bit in allo. And I'm going to show just a couple of our own data slides here. So when I first started doing myeloma, Dr. Siegel and I, because we we're real close when we started doing myeloma, it was, I hate to admit now, it's 27 years ago. Um, the average survival was two and a half years. Two and a half years, 27 years ago. And we used to give a regimen called VAD. If we have any old timers here, VAD is not Velcade, but it was vincristinated mycin dexamethasone. That was the standard therapy up until the 90s. And it wasn't until really 98 when we started, when the Arkansas group actually first found that thalidomide worked. But we did know before that, our mentor, because Dr. Siegel and I both worked in Arkansas, came up with the idea that we could take patients with refractory disease, give them high dose of IV melphalan, not oral melphalan, Dr. Suzanne was talking about for um, amyloid, they give oral melphalan, but IV melphalan at high doses could overcome resistance, and sure enough it could. So they decided to move that into the upfront setting, give patients high dose melphalan, and it's not a true transplant, most of what we talk about is really a rescue operation because the melphalan is non-discriminatory. It's not current, everything now is targeted therapy, right, or genomic based. Melphalan just kills indiscriminately, wipes out the marrow. We have to rescue the patients. We give them back their own. At that time, it was bone marrow. Now we essentially only use stem cells. So up until the 1990s, no one had a better regimen than plain oral melphalan. This is the first trial. It was published way back in 1996, where they looked at high-dose therapy versus conventional therapy. It was a French trial. They found the high-dose therapy group did better. So since 1996, this has been considered standard of care for patients with myeloma. Current treatment uh, paradigms. Initial therapy, which I'm not going to talk about, someone else is going to talk about. And then consolidation, transplants really consolidating the initial therapy. With current treatment regimens, essentially everyone responds. There are exceptions. I'm, we do this all the time. But essentially everyone responds to initial therapy. We consolidate them with uh, a transplant. And then you may want to give either post-transplant therapy or maintenance therapy. Different issue. That's for patients who are going to get transplanted. Patients who did not get transplanted get initial therapy and they stay on therapy. Current modality and treatment algorithms for myeloma is you never stop treatment for their entire lives. That's the current approach besides our center because we don't believe in maintenance therapy. Everywhere else in the world, you give initial therapy, you stay on drugs, whatever they need forever. When one drug set doesn't work, you switch to another drug set. No drug holidays for patients with myeloma. And then when they relapse, somebody else is going to talk about what we can do at relapse. So. Why, what do we do? For younger patients, almost all of them get three drug regimens. An immunomodulatory drug, we're, we're kind of out of sequence here, but an immunomodulatory drug, a proteasome inhibitor, and the dreaded corticosteroids, dexamethasone. So this is the current standard for anyone at, throughout the world getting a, a transplant. And then they're everywhere except for our center, which I'm going to talk about briefly, usually puts patients on <coughs> therapy after transplant. We don't, we want, so the questions arise, should you keep torturing patients before the transplant, give them various regimens to get them in a, the best response, or just transplant them, or should you just transplant them with whatever response you get with? And then there's this issue of depth of response. Current, current uh, goal, the surrogate marker right now, which has not been well documented in prospective randomized trials, is minimal residual disease. This is true for myeloma, it's true for ALL, it's true for CLL, it's true for everything about minimal residual disease. So when you look at the different prep uh, induction regimens, these are category one by the NCCN. No insurance company in the world will give you any hassle about these regimens because they're approved. No one uses bortezomib, doxorubicin, and dex, Doxorubicin, some in Europe do, but no one in the United States use this. It's usually RD, lenalidomide dex, lenalidomide uh, bortezomib dex, or one of the things that's, although it's a category 2A in the NCCN, is carfilzomib lenalidomide dex. But for the most part, something like 60 to 70 percent of the patients in the U.S. get RVD. There's an increasing use of KRD, even though these two have not been compared directly in a head-to-head -head competition. When you look at the response rates for these various alphabet soups of drugs, 
If you look at the blue line, the overall response rates are essentially approaching 100%. The drug regimens, regardless of which one you use, has an excellent response rate. So how do you differentiate between one and the other? Again, someone else is probably going to deal with frontline therapy, but you look at the depth of response. So VGPR is a 90% improvement in their paraproteins, and the VGPR rates do differ some with the different regimens. And then there's the complete remission rates. And the complete remission rates, this is cyclophosphamide, bortezomib-lenamide dex, not carfilzomib. The complete response rates of over 40% with RVD. I need to add the KRD line over here because the complete response rates are up here in the 50 to 60% range with KRD without a transplant. So if you have this greater response, why do we need to torture the patients, make them lose the hair, put them in the hospital for two weeks, um, and, and go through a transplant? Can we just leave them alone and say, we've really achieved a good thing, they're in complete remission, why should we bother? Patients don't want to do it, the insurance companies don't want to do it, the insurance companies probably do want to do it because it's cheaper than doing regular therapy. And we need to fi figure out, should we bother transplanting these patients? So let's give you the data. I'm going to show you at least three trials. This is an older trial, older being 2014, New England Journal of Medicine trial. It's done in Italy. They gave lenalidomide dex, and then they randomized the patients to a regimen we never use in the U.S., which is lenalidomide oral melphalan and prednisone versus tandem transplant. So non-transplant, transplant. Then there was a second randomization to maintenance or no maintenance. So we're trying to answer the question here, should you have a transplant or not? Now one of the, one of the criticisms of this study is it doesn't contain a, a proteasome inhibitor. There's no bortezomib or carfilzomib in this regimen. So that's one of the problems with this trial, looking at it in, retrospectively. Bottom line, I'm not going to bore you with all this, is the group that had the transplant and the maintenance group, and maintenance did best, second best group of the group that had the transplant without the maintenance, and the MPR, the, not the consolidation group lost. When they looked at overall survival, there was a trend to an improvement with the transplant and the maintenance group. That's the first trial. This is a trial that was presented at last ASH meeting. This is a big trial. It's a U.S. French trial. All they showed so far is the U.S. data. The U.S. trial has not met accrual yet. So it's 700 in France, 700 in the U.S. This is just the French part of the trial. There's a little bit difference in the trial design. We have everyone gets three cycles and everyone gets their stem cells collected after three cycles. Both groups do. Because this is really meant to be an early versus late transplant trial, not transplant versus no transplant. Previous one was transplant versus no transplant. This is early versus late. Everyone gets their stem cells collected. This group gets one transplant. They get consolidation with RVD and then they get lenalidomide maintenance. This group gets their cells collected here. They get eight, another five cycles of RVD and lenalidomide maintenance. So you want to look at RVD versus transplant in this comparison. The difference between the U.S. trial and the French trial, this part's the same. The, US, the French think that you can't have more than 12 months of lenalidomide. The U.S. trial is lenalidomide till progression. So one's a finite uh, maintenance, the other one is indefinite maintenance. This is the data that was the preliminary data shows that the progression-free survival at four years was superior with a hazard ratio of 0.69. So the transplant group beat the non-transplant group. Overall response rates are the same. The very good response rates were better. Second primary malignancies, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, were a, a hair higher in the group that got the transplant versus those that didn't, but wasn't statistically significant at this point in time. Let's skip that. This is a trial that's presented at ASCO. It's, it's actually quite convoluted. It's a European uh, Dutch trial. Where's our man over there trying to stay awake? It's a European Dutch trial where they gave actually all the elements you'd want, but they gave them in a different sequence. Um, they gave melphalan, prednisone, bortezomib versus cybor D, which uh, Suzanne talked about that they use for amyloid, it also works, you know, they learn from the myeloma experience. So you get cybor D, and then they, this group gets a transplant, one or two cycles, it was dependent on the, on the institution, they could decide one or two, it's not part of the randomization. Then they get either consolidation or no consolidation. So they get a proteasome inhibitor here, proteasome inhibitor here, and then consolidation they get with or without an immunomodulatory drug. And then they all go on 
lenalidomide maintenance. So they have, again, transplant versus no transplant. Both groups have a proteasome inhibitor. Both groups have an immunomodulatory drug. This is the breakdown. It's, it's, it's actually not of interest. It's a large study. It's 1,200 patients. I still can't quite understand their high risk definitions here, which are higher than we normally see. What they found was that the group that got the transplant had a superior progression-free survival, superior progression-free survival at three years, and this was statistically significant with the hazard ratio of 0.73. Transplant beat the non-transplant group. When they looked at the group that had high risk cytogenetics, which is a large proportion of their patients, higher than we normally see, the group that got the transplant did better than the group that didn't do the transplant. So when they looked at a actually multivariate analysis, this is a no-brainer. People that get deeper responses have better outcomes. People with standard risk cytogenetics have better outcomes. These are all expected. The group that had the transplant hazard ratio overall was 0.54. So 46% improvement in progression-free survival in the group that had the transplant. So there, there's actually another trial that I didn't show you that's also kind of a contorted trial. So there's four trials of transplant versus no transplant. All of them show a progression-free survival advantage. The older two trials, the original Italian trial showed you, this is another European trial, actually show an improvement in overall survival of transplant versus no transplant, okay? So if you're not convinced, we have to wait till we see further data on both these trials. These are all preliminary data on the ASH and the ASCO trials. So if one transplant's good, two trans is better. So again, this was pioneered in the Arkansas group, and the idea was similar to the philosophy with AML. If you have a patient with AML, you give them induction therapy, and you give them four cycles of consolidation. Why? They're already in remission after the first cycle of induction because we know they have residual disease. So if you use that concept in myeloma, we know we don't cure them. Well, we should do more than one transplant. You can kill more disease. So this was pioneered. The Arkansas group was not randomized. Everyone. We, everyone we saw got two transplants, but there were trials that were done in Europe and France where they looked at one versus two. And when they did the one versus two, they found in the French and the European trials that if you didn't get a complete remission, those were the patients who had the better outcome with the second transplant. So everyone was doing second transplants for a while. If they didn't get a good response, and then maintenance therapy got thrown into the mix, made it even more confusing. So there, there is data on one versus two with modern therapy. The trials I alluded to were started in 1994 and 1996. These were ancient trials in this day and age, this one versus two. So do we have modern trials looking at the same question, one versus two? This is the same trial I just showed you, the European trial with the consolidation versus no, cons uh, versus no consolidation. And this was a group that got two transplants, one transplant, and the ones that didn't get the transplants, and in a non-randomized fashion, the group that got two transplants had a superior outcome in the preliminary data analysis. There is a large U.S. trial that I'm on the steering committee. This, i almost certain, is going to be presented at ASH this year. Two trials, two, two transplants followed by maintenance, one transplant consolidation, maintenance, or one transplant alone. We're hopefully going to look at this and come up with the answer whether you need two transplants or not. Can consolidation substitute for a transplant? Ash, look for it. Maintenance therapy. This is the NCCN guidelines. Lenalidomide and thalidomide, no one, I think, even in the, in the U.S. or Europe anymore uses thalidomide, mainly because of neuropathy. I'm not sure that thalidomide's an inferior drug. In fact, the data with thalidomide maintenance is actually quite good, except that toxicity is so high. Patients can't stay on it very long because of toxicities. There is category 2A. I'm going to show you some data on bortezomib. Uh, it's mainly Dr. Sonnenfeld's data on bortezomib maintenance. There are other regimens. Most of the stuff was done in Europe, mainly by the Spanish group of, of bortezomib prednisone, bortezomib thalidomide. Interferon hasn't been used in centuries, it seems like. Steroids have been used and so forth. But they're actually listed as a 2B. Maybe do we know if the response rate and duration of response on salvage app is impacted by having a transplant before or maintenance? So this, most of the salvage transplant data that's out there was, was reported before people were routinely using maintenance. Mm -hmm. So I can't answer that. We don't have a whole lot of new data since maintenance became standard and then looked at second transplants. There's not a lot of information on that. 
In fact, there's only one randomized trial of maintenance versus, I mean, of transplant versus standard therapy. It was published by um, the UK group where they either gave a transplant or cytoxin. Transplant group won. But those patients didn't get maintenance before that with lenalidomide, which is what we're using now. So I can't answer that question. So this is thalidomide. Thalidomide actually works very well. When you look at the depth of response, you go through a transplant, you get thalidomide, you get a better response. When you look at the three-year event-free survival, it's superior with, with thalidomide. And you actually look at the overall survival, they're all statistically significant. Thalidomide works. No one can tolerate it. So this is a trial looking at um, Let's, this is a horrible slide. Um, they looked at whether you got maintenance or no maintenance with, so they got, let's just focus on this group. Melphalan, because I don't want to talk about regular therapy, melphalan, and then maintenance or no maintenance. The group that got melphalan and the maintenance had the superior outcome. The overall survivals were not significant in this trial. I showed you this trial before. This is the group that got two transplants, let alone maintenance. This is the group that did the best. When they look at the IFM trial, the IFM, the French group, did a maintenance with lenalidomide versus no uh, lenalidomide after transplant. The lenalidomide arm had the superior progression-free survival, no difference in overall survival. The US group did a trial of lenalidomide maintenance versus placebo, maintenance one. They see a difference in overall survival. So they had a progression-free survival and an overall survival advantage in this trial. So there has been a meta-analysis looking at those three trials. Meta-analysis is just like taking a bunch of numbers, throwing them together, see what you get. I'm not a big fan of meta-analysis, but what they did in the meta-analysis is when they looked at those three trials I just showed you and put the patients all together, they found the group that they had the lenalidomide, the seven-year overall survival was 62% versus 50%, translated in two and a half year longer overall survival when they combined the three trials. And that's what's shown on this slide. If anyone wants any of my slides, I'd be happy to give them. So they took the three trials, they found this difference in seven year survival, and they found this two and a half year improvement in overall survival. I would like to point out, and the reason we don't use this is this is an ad hoc, this is a meta analysis. The other trials were ad hoc analyses on maintenance. Only one of the three trials showed a by themselves before you combine and crunch the numbers together showed a survival advantage. So our thought at our facility is we don't use maintenance because we can always salvage them with maintenance. So our group is like one of the few in the world who doesn't put patients on maintenance and our group is one of the few in the world that doesn't have patients on continuous therapy for their entire lives. Because they get uh, on average about 30 month to three year remission duration after their transplant without any treatment. We think we can salvage them with lenalidomide and therefore we don't do that. When you look at lenalidomide in the context of melphalan, lenalidomide in the context of melphalan, not lenalidomide by itself, you can get second primary malignancies, they can be solid tumors, they can be hematologic malignancies. So when you look at lenalidomide with melphalan, you can see in this one, lenalidomide melphalan, solid tumor incidence is 4.4 at five years. Hematologic malignancy is 3.9. If you don't have any lenalidomide, it's the, stand, the underlying risk is 3.4, 1.4. There's no doubt that when you give lenalidomide in the context of melphalan, sometime within the, you know, most of the maintenance start within two to three months, that there's increase in second malignancies. There's no doubt about it. It's small, but it's there. So this, what about bortezomib? This is actually Dr. Sonnenfeld's study. Again, we're dealing with older regimens here. VAD is vincristin, adriamycin, dexamethasone. P is PS341, which is what bortezomib, Velcade, eventually was, was initially called adriamycin, dexamethasone, transplant, transplant, depending on which country, because this is a German-Dutch study. The Germans did two transplants, the Dutch did one, right? So, um, and then they either got thalidomide, or bortezomib. And what Peter showed was the group that had the bortezomib before and bortezomib after had a superior progression-free survival and there was also an advantage for overall survival if you got bortezomib before and after transplant. And the group that actually did the best were those that had two transplants 
And the group that got the bortezomib before, two transplants, bortezomib after, actually helped with the 17P deletions, the high-risk patients, and also the renal insufficiency patients. And if I'm wrong on this, he can correct me when he, and, and, and tell me. But that's my understanding. Perfect, good. So there's another trial where they actually did, it, it, the, another trial from Europe, it's, it's only been reported in abstract form at ASCO, where they looked at bortezomib versus observation. So the other one is bortezomib versus thalidomide, this is bortezomib versus observation. These are the slides. They found that yes, bortezomib did provide a longer remission duration, it was six months. And overall survival was not different between the two groups. So. This trial did again showed bortezomib as a superior PFS, but it was only a six month improvement. This again, if you go back, they only got four cycles of bortezomib for con consolidation or maintenance, whatever you want to call it. What about exasimib, the oral proteasome inhibitor? This is not transplant data. This is data that Saji Kumar showed. They did a IRD regimen, exasimib lenalidomide dex, and then they went on, they could go on to exasmin maintenance. There was 34 patients in the trial, 21 went on to exasmin. I'm going to give you data on 21 patients. 21 patients, they looked at that, and what they found is they had upgrade in the group that got the IRD followed by I by 48 percent, and the survival curves looked superior for the group that had the IRD with the exasmin versus those that didn't continue. Still not ready for prime time. It's been studied, the study's completed, in exasimib versus observation post-transplant. Data is not available yet. It hasn't read out. So minimal residual disease. I got to get going on this. So this is Sagarlonial's trial uh, slide. This is our patients with their their SPEP. It's above the above the water. This is when you look at free light chains. Then you can look at their bone marrows. You can look at flow cytometry. And down here at the bottom, you can look at molecular or next generation sequencing, and we need to keep getting to the bottom, and hopefully we can cure the disease. So this is the importance of minimal residual disease. If you get a CR better, this is progression-free survival. CR did better than groups that didn't get uh, a CR, and actually when you even divide out the complete remission, stringent CR versus CR or near CR, stringent CR's deeper response do even better. This is true for PFS as well as OS. When you look at minimal residual disease, these patients are CRs. There's three different technologies. They are now using 10 color flow cytometric analysis, next generation sequencing, and there's now criteria for PET-CT MRD. And again, whichever technology you use, if you get negative, you do better. By looking at minimal residual disease, flow cytometric analysis gets you to 10 to the minus fifth, as far as detecting cells, next generation sequencing gets you 10 to the minus 6. And PET-CT gives you a radiographic look at the overall body, not one point in time. So what happens when you look at MRD? By, this is by flow cytometry. If you, have, if you have no adverse features, you have normal cytogenetics, and you're MRD negative, you have a great outcome. If you have adverse cytogenetic features and are not, not MRD negative, you have a dismal outcome. MRD does appear to be a surrogate marker for outcomes for PFS as well as OS. I want to show you a non-randomized trial. Very impressive data. These are two trials. They were done sequentially. They weren't not done at the same time. Trial A is Carfilzomib Lendex, four cycles. No, they did not get a transplant. They get four more cycles, and then they stay on KRD actually for two years and go on LEND maintenance. So we have KRD essentially for two years and LEND maintenance. This trial done after the first one, KRD, a transplant, and then KRD, and then maintenance. So we have the same basic regimen, one with transplant, one without transplant, with KRD, Carfilzomib Lendex. What they found were that A, Response rates keep improving with subsequent lines of, of therapy. Four cycles, eight cycles, 12 cycles. By the time you get to 12 cycles, the stringent complete remission is 82% in the group that had the transplant versus 51% in the group that didn't. Looks like the transplant really improved the depth of response significantly. What about 
let's not show this, MRD evaluation. So there's two different MRD evaluations here. One is done by flow, one's done by next generation sequencing. The white is NGS, the red is flow. The group that had the KRD in the transplant by flow cytometric analysis, 100% minimal residual disease. The group that didn't have the transplant comparing apples to apples, 51%. When you look at next generation sequencing, 75% MRD negative, 24% with this particular regimen. This is a regimen probably of the future, also which one of my colleagues is probably going to talk about. You're going to throw daratumumab into the mix. So MRD at this point is still not, it's a, it's a desired endpoint, but we still haven't looked at if your MRD negative, do you need to do anything? Very important point. So we got rid of their disease, their MRD negative, do you leave them alone or do you keep treating them? We don't know. Trials are being done to look at that. Should you keep pounding patients to get them to MRD negative and use up everything you have, and then you don't have anything left after that? We don't know. This is really, it, it looks great when I show you the progression-free survival and overall survival. We're not really sure what to do with it till we have prospective trials to actually answer that question. Allogeneic transplant, high response rates. There's a graft versus myeloma effect. There's absolutely a graft versus myeloma effect has a mortality in the 10 to 20 percent range. Using an autologous transplant, the mortality rate's less than 1 percent if you're under 70. The mortality rate with even reduced intensity in, is still in the 10 to 15 percent, although I just reviewed a paper that was 5 percent. So it is better. There is an age limitation. We think in January, for those in the audience, in January, Medicare is going to have new guidelines for allogeneic transplant for myeloma. I'm on the committee. We, the government's already said yes, we had to come up with a protocol, it's going to happen. That we're going to be able to transplant Medicare patients. We can't right now. Because of sibling limitation, particularly in the older patients, we now have haploidentical transplants. Haploidentical transplants, almost everyone has a kid, a, a sibling, or a parent. It's something like 80 some percent have one of those options that you could use as a potential donor. Opens up for not only myeloma, but for a lot of other diseases of having donors using a half match. There is probably, based on older data, a plateau in the 20 to 25 percent range that we probably are curing with this disease. This is a trial that was done, actually started in 2002. It's an 0102, 2002. It was a tandem transplant versus a auto transplant followed by an allo transplant. So the group that didn't have a sibling donor had two auto transplants. The group that did had an auto followed by an allo. Large trial, 430 patients this group, 190 patients this group. We didn't see any difference in outcomes in the US trial. Part of the problem was we used an inferior transplant regimen. They just got single dose total body radiation. No one does that anymore. Auto, auto for progression free survival is identical. Overall survival was also identical. I just saw a week ago the eight-year follow-up data looks exactly the same. Even with a high-risk patient? Even with a high-risk patient at eight years, it's not been published, um, but at the meeting I was at a uh, week, uh, week ago, they showed me the eight-year follow-up data. It's identical, the two arms. But, because I want to show you this, patients that had graft-versus-host disease when they looked at their outcomes, the group that had chronic graft-versus-host disease had a lower relapse rate in this trial. It was a trend, because there wasn't, statistically, wasn't enough patients. In contrast, the Europeans did almost the same trial. Not identical, almost the same trial. They showed a marked difference in the group that had auto allo, that that auto allo on won. And it wasn't just a little bit they won hands down. When they looked at the group who was progression-free survival, at 96 months, it's 22% versus 12%. When they looked at a group who were alive, 50% versus 36% at 96 months, that the auto allo group won. So how do you read the difference? We don't know. No one knows the difference. No one can explain this. I don't know why the difference is. I don't know why there's a difference. Has there, ever, has there been any long-term follow-up in terms of high-risk no. disease in the European trial? No. But I can tell you in the US trial, because I unpublished data not being presented so it's not embargoed there was no difference in that trial 
Um, part of the reason was that, they, that the, high, the definition of high risk changed from the time they did that trial to now. So that makes it complicated. And they <coughs> So, I mean, when the U.S. trial was done, we didn't even know about 17P, just for example. So their definition of high risk was 13 by karyotype and high beta 2. The, our, our concept of what's high risk has evolved over time as we learn more. This is our data from Hackensack, 118 patients. This is our overall survival at, of 118 patients with a six-year follow-up, and our overall survival is approaching 70% in patients who are transplanted as consolidation up front, and even salvage patients have about a 40% overall survival at six years. This is, this is, this is actually very impressive data for, for the whole group. The group that had chronic GVHD had a superior outcome to the group that didn't have chronic GVHD. So our survival curves actually look good, and chronic GVHD is actually <coughs> a horrible thing to have to mess with, but the patients did better if they had chronic GVHD. There is an ongoing U.S. trial for high-risk high patients. They get flu malvalve, a fludarabine melflin bortezomib, and then there's maintenance to see if we can prevent relapse with exasmib, the oral proteasome inhibitor versus placebo. There's 21 patients enrolled. There was a stop put in because we had two unexpected early deaths. It's going to open up again in the ne next month. Briefly, I don't have time to do this, CAR T cells. Um, Ed, who's over in the other session, published the first paper on CAR T cells. This is his patient of CAR T cells. Patient got an auto transplant, didn't have much of a response to auto transplant, got salvage therapy, really was going nowhere. Disease came back, gave hydocyclophosphamide. Then they gave melflin with CAR T cells to CD19, and look at that. Patient went into complete remission with a lower dose of melphalan, which some people could say, well, maybe it's because their e disease evolved, they have a different clone, maybe the melphalan is going to work again. It's possible, um, not probable, but it really looks like the CAR T cells to CD19 works. The problem with CAR T cells to CD19 is myeloma patients only about 20% 20, 20 of them express CD19? Less than, that. Less than that. So it's not a really good target. So. BCMA is supposedly, and my research team is here, supposedly expressed on all myeloma cells, um, which is apparently not the case, or at least not high levels of it. This is an abstract by Korkendorfer, who presented it at ASCO, of giving a different target for the CAR T cells using the B cell maturation antigen. And they gave a non-ablative regimen, they gave the CAR T cells different loading doses of phase one trial, and you can see here that they did get some responses. This is without myeloma therapy, that's just immunosuppressive therapy, and they got some complete responses with this regimen. They were not particularly durable. All but one of the patients who responded has relapsed within a year, but they did get responses. So in conclusion, autotransplant standard care, superior to conventional therapy, send your patients for autotransplant. Um, maintenance therapy, the multivariate analysis shows an improvement. I'm not sure I believe in the multivariate analysis, um, but most centers are using this even though we do not have that philosophy. Future of the world is going to be KRD and DARA. No data on it yet. It's on ongoing trials. DARA 2 MAB, which one of my colleagues is going to talk about the anti-CD38. Early transplant is superior to late transplant. We should try to get MRD, but no one really knows how to get there or what we do with it once we get there. And allergenic transplants remain investigational, but potentially are curative. And we think we project 20 to 30 percent of the patients. That's it. Questions? Or do I have time? Sorry if I missed you, David. The patient which is very early CR, I don't know how early you check that, but early CR do not um, benefit less from the auto transplant than the patient who. So I, I don't know if that anyone's ever updated that data, and we've got a bunch of people here who maybe help to answer that question. We used to think the patients who responded fast were the ones that actually relapsed fast too, but I don't know if that's really true anymore. But there was one paper, it's actually from Arkansas, I think, that showed the fast responders actually had a poorer outcome. I, I don't know that that ever held up in any other trials. What do you think? I mean, part, part of that was a self-fulfilling 
uh, 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 philosophy because they, they were looking at, uh, at responses post-transplant. So obviously, if you continue to demonstrate a slow response for, for six months after your transplant, that's six months in which you can't relapse. So you have to do a landmark analysis, which they never did. So part of it is just the, the, you know, the statistical trick of, of, of looking at it that way. Peter? Well, there has been a meta-analysis of four large European trials, all uh, in the frontline setting, uh, comparison with and no protection. In that analysis, more than 1,800 patients done by Dr. Capo from Italy, less than CR before transplant is an unfavorable prognostic factor. That the CR before transplant is much stronger predictor than CR after transplant for long-term outcome. Right. In that same analysis. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you.